Well, thank you very much, and thank you very much for the TBA too for inviting me to be here. Um, I thought it would be good to start with defining first what colic means and which particular types of colic am I going to talk about today. So often with definitions it's a good idea to go to the Oxford English Dictionary, which I did yesterday, and initially I thought, well that's not really very helpful, they're obviously talking about babies, but the definition in the English Dictionary today is that colic refers to severe, often fluctuating pain in the abdomen caused by gas or obstruction. And what I didn't like about that initially was the word severe, um, but I think um, perhaps on reflection that is quite useful for us to bear in mind. As vets, we're always taught to tell people that colic is a clinical sign. It is not a discrete disease entity. And I think that that's a common misconception um, in the horse owning public that there's sort of one big bad thing called colic. But of course there are colics and colics. And what colic actually means, at least in veterinary terms, is abdominal pain. So it's a sign, it's not a disease. And that becomes quite important when you start to think about the causes of colic, because of course if there are many different types of colic, there are therefore um, many different causes. But I'm going to try to draw out some of the themes um, today, and in particular focus on the environmental things. But I thought it might not be a bad idea to start with a quiz. So I've got three different horses here, and you've hopefully been watching them for the last few minutes. And so what I would like you to do is do a show of hands to tell me which one has the, the most severe colic. Is it number one, the horse at the top, number two, the pony in the middle, or number three, the foal at the bottom? So hands up for number one. Nobody thinks it's very bad. Hands up for number two. Nobody thinks that's got bad colic. And hands up for number three. Well, you're all wrong. <laughs> so, it's actually number two. Um, so what I wanted to do was make the point is that the way an animal expresses colic is very dependent on that, on that animal and not necessarily the severity of the disease that it has. So foals are very, very good at telling us that, it's, that they are uncomfortable. They lie on their backs, they wave their legs around. It's really quite distressing to have to deal with them. They make a big fuss. Um, most adult horses will make variable degrees of fuss, but in, as a sort of general rule, I'd say probably two-year-old thoroughbred fillies would be about the most expressive. But um, what is also true is that um, some of the older, perhaps older ponies can be really quite stoical and they're not necessarily showing very severe signs. But the reason why this particular pony is much the most severe is what it's showing is what's called parietal pain. Now um, we, we talk about terms in terms of pain in terms of either being parietal or visceral. The horse at the top is showing visceral pain. And what does that mean? Well visceral refers to the actual intestines, the viscera within the abdomen and so the pain in the horse at the top is because it's got a very distended colon it's quite uncomfortable. The pony actually and, and incidentally the foal also has visceral pain um, the pony has very severe peritonitis and that is defined as parietal pain which is the lining of the abdomen and actually parietal pain is probably more painful than visceral pain. The thing with parietal pain is that you don't move um, so they stand very still and that's what you're looking at there. Anyway, um, another sort of background introductory comment about colic is that um, Colic can be the dominant clinical sign in some cases with specific GI diseases, and that's really what I want to talk about today. Colic can also be a sort of variable, pre uh, variably present clinical sign, so that if you're given, given any specific disease, let's say, for example, gastric ulcers, you might expect that all horses with gastric ulcers are going to have colic, surely. Actually, relatively few of them have colic. Most horses with gastric ulcers present with other signs and some of them can have low-grade colic. Um, but that would be an example of something that's variably present. And of course, don't forget that colic discomfort in the abdomen can come from non-intestinal diseases too. 
And finally, colic can accompany other more prominent signs, both with GI disease and non-intestinal disease. And an example of that you're going to be hearing about this afternoon is Lasonia. Um, some falls with Lasonia will be a bit uncomfortable, but it doesn't tend to be the most prominent sign, which is more typically weight loss. So for, for this morning anyway, um, and the rest of this presentation, I'm going to be talking about colic when it's the dominant clinical sign, and um, I'm going to restrict my comments to colics associated with GI disease. And. Um, it's useful to sort of subdivide that, and this is not a conventional way of presenting it, but I think it's quite um, helpful um, f to simplify it. We can think about colic as being due to some form of dysfunction in the, the intestine. So the, the intestine, the purpose of the intestine is to move the um, ingesta through the, um, the horse while it digests it and absorbs the nutrients. So functional colic might imply that there's either an alteration in motility, so that might be increased motility or decreased motility. Might, there might be the accumulation of gas or there might be the accumulation of the ingesta, i.e. impactions. But for the purposes of thinking about um, the risk factors, we can lump all that together into some sort of functional problem. And generally, medical therapy is likely to be the mo most appropriate there. The other colics, perhaps the more frightening ones, are those in which something has gone wrong with the position of the intestine. So a portion of intestine is relocated within the abdomen. That might be due to a displacement, it might be due to a twist, but essentially something's wrong with the position. Or it might indeed be something like a mesenteric rent, which is a tear through which the intestine squeezes. Now, you can further subdivide that into those that compromise the blood supply and those that don't. But as a broad category, these are the horses that are likely to land up in surgery. And it's also probably important to recognize that I've put that dotted line in that dysfunction can then lead on to some abnormality of, of position. And when we think about risk factors, things that have led up to these events, they also can be broadly categorized into those that are not modifiable, so factors such as age, sex, breed. If you have a horse of a given age and a given sex, then there's nothing that you can do to change that. And at least for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to say there's nothing that we can do about the weather either. Whereas modifiable risk factors are, are those that are probably of more interest because these are the things that you can change, your feeding practices, your parasite status, the exercise level of the horse. So a final uh, word of introduction, it's taken me a long time to introduce where I'm going with this, is but I, we can clearly have a variety of different types of horses on stud farms, but for this presentation, I'm going to confine my comments to weanlings and yearlings as one group and to mares and I'm going to leave foals and stallions for another day. So let's start off with intestinal colic in the brood mare. Um, brood mares aren't any more prone to developing the uh, functional type of colics, the non-specific colics than any other horse but um, they certainly are prone to to developing non-specific colics. And there's a lots of different terminology um, that people might use to describe this, um, which broadly speaking, I'm just gonna lump together. So you'll hear people talk about spasmodic colic. Medical colic is a, is a popular way to describe it. And it means something really only to vets. What they mean by that is they're gonna treat it with medicine and not refer it to, for surgery. Um, people will talk about cramping up, gas colic. Let's just lump them all together and call them non-specific specific colics. And then the main positional form of colic in uh, brood mares is, of course, I'm sure many of you will know this, the colon torsion. So what are the risk factors for non-specific colic? Well, actually, in, over the last 10 years in particular, but probably starting a little bit um, before then, there's been a huge effort, not only in the UK, where the University of Liverpool leads this field, but also internationally um, to look at risk factors for, for the non-specific colic. And you'll be pleased to hear that what the, um, through 
the considerable efforts of numerous scientists across the world slaving over hot um, computers has by and large confirmed what you already knew. Um, good old fashioned horsemanship, I think. Um, so the factors that have now been shown, I've picked out those that, that appear in multiple studies. Um, as So I, I haven't covered every single risk factor that's been mentioned in every single paper, but the things that are known in multiple studies to increase the risk for non-specific colic um, is change. Horses do not like change. So it's the change in diet rather than the diet per se, the change in concentrate or the change in the batch of hay. They also don't like change in stabling. They don't like large, in terms of colic, large amounts of concentrate are a risk factor. There's one study in, in, that came from Texas which um, indicated that round bale hay was a problem. And um, this is quite a good example of um, what's known in statistical terms as a proxy. So um, just as a, a little aside to explain what I mean by that is that you can show statistically that people who wear gold watches are more likely to have heart attacks. Is that because gold watches cause heart attacks? No, it's because it's part of a package. So people who wear gold watches in the city of London are likely to be male, they're likely to be middle-aged or approaching middle age, they may eat a lot, they perhaps don't have time to exercise. That whole package, which is indicated by their gold watch, leads them up to their heart attack. So in back in Texas, um, the, the people who wrote this study suggested that perhaps it wasn't the round bale hay per se that was causing the colic, mm -hmm. but that this was an indicator of quality rather than specifically round bale. Now, I'm not suggesting that round bale hay is always poor quality, but in this part of Texas, they felt that it was part of a package um, that might indicate that the horses eating the round bale hay were eating poorer quality hay. Longer time in the stable versus um, being turned out is a risk factor for colic. Turning horses out onto lush pasture is a risk factor. Increasing stocking density, and I think we'll hear more about that from some of the later speakers. And also change in level of exercise. Now, I'm not going to say too much about exercise because that's probably more relevant in the horse in training or uh, engaged in sports of other act uh, activities like that, and perhaps not so relevant today. What are the factors that are going to decrease the risk of, of colic? Increased access to pasture. Um, I think it actually was the same study as the Texas one. Access to ponds. Now this was interpreted as the researchers as probably being another example of a proxy. So they felt that the ones that had the access to ponds were the ones that were kept on the bigger farms with more access to pasture. Now when you're doing statistical modeling there are ways to sort of compensate for these interactions between factors but nevertheless it, it was felt that this was probably just a pond was more likely to be present in the bigger farms with more pasture. However, looking at water specifically, um, horses that um, uh, providing water in, um, I don't, providing water where the water is not going to run out decreases the risk. So any system where the horse is being fed, given water in a container, is not as good as a permanent um, supply. Um, I think that I think I'm making sense there. It seems like I'm kind of being a bit long-winded, but the basic point is that in order to prevent, decrease the risk of colic, you've got to give adequate water. Some of the studies produce slightly conflicting results across studies. So st studies on parasite control actually have conflicting, conflicting results depending on which particular defi definitions of colic you use. And I'll return to that um, point later on and weather patterns also produce conflicting results. The other thing we know about non-specific colic is that it tends to, to recur. So once a horse has had colic once, um, we we are we know that it's prone to prone to recur. And in a um, study actually funded by the Horse Trust, um, uh, Dr. Scantlebury, who was based in the University of Liverpool at that time, 
um, wanted to look at that in a bit more detail. So this study was published back in um, 2011 in Equine Veterinary Journal, and she recruited a group of horses who had had one bout of colic, and the first thing she did was monitor these horses over time to find out how many of them uh, had colic again. And she found that the, the likelihood of them having colic again was quite high. So for every 100 horses that she found, uh, that, that started off having had one bout of colic, um, half of them would have had another event within two years, and that's expressed as 50 colic events for every 100 horses, horse years. And of the, that group, 35 of the colic events were sufficiently severe that, that a vet had to be called. Uh, Dr. Scanterbury also looked at what risk factors were there for increased risk of recurrence and she's done done that in two studies in fact both listed here one in 2011 one in 2015 slightly different methodology with slightly different results so in her first study she showed that if a horse had a dental problem it was more likely to have recurrent colic and interestingly she found in both studies a link between crib biting and wind sucking and in the second study a link behind uh, between weaving and recurrent colic and so that is suggesting that the horse behavior patterns may influence the likelihood of recurrent colic the thing that uh, that was um, i think of most practical benefit is that she showed that there were quite clearly that, that there was a decrease of colic recurring as the horses were provided more time at pasture. So the one practical thing that you can do if you do have a horse that is prone to colic is to make sure that it spends time at pasture as much as possible. What about the role of parasites in the adult horse? So I'm going to talk about parasites again and again, but um, we know that in the adult horse, probably it's the mixed strongyle burdens and the tapeworms that may contribute in some individuals to non-specific colic. And the TBA is very much to be commended in that they've done a lot of research in particular, or funded a lot of research in recent years uh, with Dr. Matthews, uh, uh, based at the Morden, um, uh, looking at the, um, the worm control pra practices, and in particular looking at um, anthelmintic resistance. So I'm just very brief, and I know that, um, sorry, I call it Professor Matthews has been here a number of times, so I'm not going to spend too much time talking about worm control, but I just wanted to make some general points. The first and most important are listed here. Drugs cannot substitute for appropriate stocking density and pasture management. The days of drugs are over, and we increasingly are finding that the drugs are not effective, so that we have to go back to pasture management, stocking density, to try and find the solution. And it's also clear that the, revel relev the prevalence of antimentic resistance is varying on different farms. But we have now documented um, resistance to all the three major ca classes of wormers. So individual farms now need to tailor their own worming strategies and, and control mechanisms in discussion with their own vet about what they know about their own farm. Having said that, some general guidelines in weanlings, what we're interested in is strongyloides, at least initially, and then um, the ascarids. So in some farms, we have to start from two months of age, and you may be choosing either fenbenzol, ivermectin, or pyrantol, depending on your own experiences. And that will typically be given every two months until autumn when moxidectin tends to be introduced. And I would urge you to use worm egg counts to um, assess the effic efficacy of um, the management practices. And by that, I mean not only drugs, but also how you're managing individual paddocks. When we get into the yearling age group, we're really primarily interested in the um, the small red worms. They're, uh, I hope you can see them there. The slide's a little bit dark, but if you look carefully, you'll see lots of little red circles. Those are the larvae within the wall of the cecum. And in the other image, those horrible white things are tapeworms in the cecum. Um, so for small, uh, small red worm and tapeworm, um, what you should be doing is something like moxidectin every three months with, with either praziclantel or a double dose um, pyrantel twice yearly. And again, I would urge you to use worm egg counts and tapeworm serology to assess the effectiveness. And when it gets back to the broodmares, um, the, this is the group in which you probably want to avoid using anthelmintics 
in those horses that are not carrying large brown bird burdens of worms so we want a low level of worms in in circulating around that are not um, resistant to anthelmintics so that the the blanket worming approach of the olden days is no longer viable so in your permanent herd you should be thinking about targeted worming um, only the subgroup that have high worm egg counts and positive um, tapeworm serology. New arrivals onto the farm, obviously, you can use those tools to assess their worm status and worm as appropriate. Now, let's think a minute about the tests for worms. Um, we have two main tools. We can use the fecal uh, egg counts and serological tests. Now, the problem with fecal egg counts is that they're only telling you that there are live adults in the intestine laying eggs. So they don't pick up the larvae, and they're not really very reliable for tapeworm. Serology is complementary in the sense that Serology is a little bit of a historical look. It's what, what it's based on is identifying antibody, either in serum or there are new tests where we can look in saliva. And that's the immune product that the, the horse has made when it encounters the parasite that you're interested in. It makes this immune response, it makes the antibody, and you pick that up either in the blood or serum. So it's confirming that the horse has encountered this parasite, but there's a, the potentially a bit of a time lag there. So the parasite can be gone and the, the antibody is still present. Currently, it's only available for tapeworm. But there is um, a project that has been going on now for about 10 years up in the Morden. Initially, the, and actually substantially, the uh, preliminary basic research was funded by the Horse Race Bedding Levy Board, and then there's been additional funding from the TBA looking at developing a serological test for cyathostomes. It's not available yet, but hopefully it will be soon. But basically, the any given um, pathogen, in this case a worm, has lots of different proteins on its surface, and these are the proteins that the body recognizes and makes an antibody. So what um, Jackie Matthews and her colleagues have, have been doing all these 10 years is testing different antigens to try and work out which antibody is sufficiently unique to the larvae to be able to develop a blood test that identifies larvae as opposed to adults. And if you want more information about that, um, then the, this is a useful place to go. It's available uh, via the EVJ website, again, funded by the Betting Levy Board. What about Stronglis vulgaris? When I was a veterinary student, that was considered to be the number one cause of colic in the horse. Can we forget about it? Is it confined to the dustbin of history? Well, it has been. Uh, Stronglis vulgaris, or the large red worm, was once a major equine parasite. And then the benzamidazoles came along in the 70s and 80s, and it disappeared. Hurrah! Unfortunately, not so hurrah, because all that happened was the cyathostomes moved in and filled the gap. Um, but recent work from Denmark is suggesting that now that anthelmintic resistance is becoming a bit more of a problem, guess what? Our old friend Stronglus vulgaris may actually be reappearing. So um, that's one to be looking out for. So that was the, my comments on non-specific colic. I'd like to move on now to colon torsion. And um, the, colon, the equine colon is a very large structure. It occupies most of the lower two-thirds of the abdomen. And it's a double horseshoe. It can move around quite a lot. And actually, it can flip over 180 degrees with no harm at all. But if it twists beyond 270 degrees, then it cuts off its own blood supply. And again, if you want to read more about that, you can go to the HBLB website, um, where the study that I'm describing now um, has been published. But with HBLB funding, uh, Dr. Southers from the University of Liverpool has looked for risk factors. And she's found that mares are more likely to develop it uh, horses that have had multiple colic episodes, taller horses, interestingly enough, those receiving medication, those that have been noted to quid, so perhaps reflecting dental disease, horses kept in stables, 
uh, horses with increasing numbers of carers and horses on the premises. Now, thinking about that, I wonder if this is another proxy. So if we know that mares are more likely to get it, they tend to be kept in large numbers with increasing numbers of, of um, carers. And in terms of feeding practices, feeding hay, feeding sugar beet, change, again, bad, change in the uh, amount of pasture, change in the amount, amount of forage. The, this group and another based in Kentucky have also looked at um, outcome factors and found that basically the things that influence the outcome are those that affect Effect, those, those that are indicators of disease severity when the horse arrives at the hospital. So the take-home lesson for the stud farmer is the early recognition of a, a mare with, um, with colon torsion is the most important thing. Prompt referral to a surgical facility so that if she does have a colon torsion, it can be rapidly dealt with um, are critical for the successful outcome. What is it about recent full, recently foaled mares that make them prone to colon torsion? Well, one of the sort of simple explanations that's often easy to say, but I'm not sure it's entirely true, is that, well, when a mare falls, then there's lots of space in her abdomen, and that just allows the colon to move around. Maybe. It's kind of a simple thing. Um, but possibly more likely, uh, the other changes that accompany foaling um, are likely to be contributing. And this is an exciting new area of science, microbiomics. Um, has, there's been a massive expansion in our knowledge of the bacteria that live around us and within us in, really in the last 10 years. So I came across this quote, um, which is something to think about. The human gut uh, has 100 trillion bacteria, okay, that's fine. But that is actually, you've, everyone sitting here has 10 times more bacterial cells within them than they have human cells. I thought you might like to know that. Um, the, there is active uh, research going on in this field, again, actually based at the combination I've mentioned several times now with HBLB funding at the University of Liverpool. They've been looking at um, the equine microbiome, as have workers um, based in the United States. And this study, um, actually only just accepted an EVJ, um, has shown that there are changes in the bacterial population within the gut in mares, this was a study done in Kentucky, that actually precede the development of colic. And that probably makes a lot more sense than just having a big empty abdomen. So without going through the details, on the left-hand side are the mares with large colon um, volvulus or colon torsion on the um, right-hand side of the others. And you can see that there's a completely different pattern. Each one of those bars represents a different bacterial species. And they are completely different in those that go on to develop colon torsion from those that do not. Moving on now um, to spend maybe 10 minutes just talking about the younger horse group, so the, the weanling and yearling group. An important form of colic in this age group is the interceptions, and this refers to a situation where we have telescoping of one portion of the intestine into the other. It can happen at different parts of the intestine, and they're slightly driven by age. So in the very young foal, it tends to be the jejunum going into the jejunum. Whereas in the weanling yearling, um, it's the il the il it's ileocecal interception. So the ileum, which is the last part of the small intestine, telescopes into the cecum. And that's what this pathological specimen is showing. I hope you can see that kind of telescoping inwards. In young horses, and sorry, there are other forms of um, interception, the seco seco and the uh, seco colic interception. They are much rarer and don't re aren't really linked to any specific age group. But in young horses, um, there have been several studies now to show that interceptions are linked to both tapeworm and larval cyathostomans. Ileocecal interception is much the most common form. Um, in this photograph, you can see, again, tapeworms collected around the ileocecal valve. It often actually has quite a slow, insidious onset. Over several days or even a couple of weeks, the, the um, animal can be showing signs. And it's sort of mild to moderate, somewhat 
fluctuating pain, particularly after eating, maybe more just ill thrift, poor appetite, and sometimes a fever, actually. It's one of these situations that it's got a fairly good prognosis with surgery, providing it's recognized sufficiently early. So, so far, I've been primarily emphasizing tapeworms and um, sciathostomans, but I also want to move on now to parascaris. Parascaris is something that a few years ago I probably wouldn't even have given it five minutes of thought, but um, this the, it's become increasingly important. There is now resistance to the macro um, cyclic lactones, which is ivermectin and uh, moxidectin. That's been present um, for you know, some 13 years now in numerous cu countries. There's also res resistance to the benzimidazoles and parantols. So in other words, all three major classes of drugs now um, have resistance. There probably has been a bit of an over-reliance on worm egg counts performed in animals that are basically too young to have infection, or patent infection, that means um, too young to have adults laying eggs in their intestines, but they still have immature worms within them. And um, overstocking, uh, unimplemented policies for clearing droppings and so forth will definitely exacerbate this problem. So um, here's what they look like. You may have seen them in feces. These are the great big worms that look like rats' tails. Um, in the, um, the video there, what we're looking at is an uh, endoscopy of the proximal duodenum, and you can see the worms floating around there. Wait, it gets better. Um, so the panel on the left-hand side um, is obviously a uh, video taken at um, surgery. And this um, weanling, um, the worm that is um, performing for us now is the one that killed the weanling in that these worms within the intestine have actually eroded through, perforated the intestine, and um, therefore that is a fatal, unfixable condition. It gets even better. In this one, actually, the interesting thing here is that these worms did not, were not the cause of the horse's colic. So this weanling actually had an abdominal abscess, and that's why it was colicking and went to surgery. But it makes the point that the worms, not just parascaris, but um, all of these things, and to some extent Lasonia, which you'll hear about later, they tend to all join together. And the, so when you've got multiple problems, um, that's when you'll get the individual who succumbs. So this foal has an abscess that's build, been building up for some weeks, and therefore it's immune compromised, and hence you land up with this sort of situation. So I hope, I'm hoping I'm convincing you that you really do need to pay attention to anthelmintic resistance. It's an important topic, and you can't avoid it. Um, this is an interesting study that's just literally come out. Um, just some comments about ascarids. Um, ascarids, the, as was illustrated in both of those videos, they, very large numbers can accumulate within the small intestine and they can actually create impactions. And in fact, they can do that when they're alive and dead. And so this is an example of something that actually worming tends to, um, or can, precipitate the onset of the colic signs. It's not causing it per se. First you have the worms, then, then the animal gets wormed, then the worms die, and the signs of colic appear. Um, so it would be useful then to know whether you're dealing with um, large numbers of worms. And with the increasing anthelmintic resistance, um, we're getting these very large worm burdens. So, so in order to try and avoid treating those individuals that have um, treating inappropriately those individuals that have very large worm burdens. This group, based in Kentucky, have looked at using ultrasound to try and identify those, that subgroup of foals that have very large worm burdens that can then be managed differently from your standard. It's important to recognize that worm egg count is not a good indicator of the reflection of burdens. So this, this video here shows how they do it. You, it's relatively easy, actually, using abdominal ultrasound. You can actually see all these worms. That's what the arrows are pointing at. 
So to summarise then my, my comments on colic, the environment and the stud farmer, there are a number of modifiable risk factors that are relevant both to the non-specific recurrent colic groups and the specific disease entities to which mares and young stock are prone. And they include um, restriction of grazing, restriction of water source, and importantly, change. Horses do not like change. They like uh, change in feeding is a risk factor, change in exercise level. There's absolutely no doubt that parasites have an important um, role, different roles for different parasites in different age groups, but parasites are important in severe, several colic conditions, and anthelmintic resistance is an increasing challenge. We need, we've got some new tools, sort of not quite within our reach, but not far off. But there's a definite need for better and refined methods to assess parasite burdens, particularly for the redworm and the ascarids. It is a very active research area, and I think some of the recent scientific developments that I've sort of alluded to through my talk are likely to continue to shed light on these mechanisms, which hopefully in turn will lead to better preventative strategies. Now, that's not quite the end of my talk. I was asked to give you uh, just a few comments about anti antimicrobial resistance, because just in case I haven't scared you enough, I'll go move on to a completely different threat that is upon us. Um, you, anybody who listens to the radio or reads the newspapers knows that the post-antimicrobial era is upon us. And there is significant concern in political circles and in medical circles that inappropriate use of antimicrobials in the veterinary species may have impact on human health. As a result of which, WHO have produced what, a list of what they call the critically important antimicrobials. And the ones that are relevant to us, when working with horses, and particularly working with horses on stud farms, are the cephalosporins, you might know Exonel, Cephanil, Cobactin, the fluoroquinolones, otherwise known as Batril, and the macrolides, erythromycin, clarithromycin, azithromycin, and rifampin. Now, I'm not going to get into today the pros and cons of this debate as to whether vets and stud farmers are harming human health. Let's just park that one aside, and I'll tell you what's happening with foals. Um, so this is reason enough, I think, to pay attention. There's increasing evidence both from the United States, and this is a, a key paper that, that came from a group in Georgia and Kentucky documenting uh, the prevalence of antimicrobial resistance. Um, similar uh, studies have been done in Ireland showing that there's an increase, increasing numbers of antimicrobial rhodococcus equi strains. This paper, um, confirms that there is no effective alternative. So if you have a foal with um, resistant R. equi, then the chances are that foal is going to die. So that's reason enough, I think, to start paying, uh, giving much more attention to which antimicrobials we're using. So what can you do about it? Well, I think the most important thing you can do is avoid that crutch of antimicrobials and unnecessary problems. So if you have a, a wound, then you know, think very carefully about, does the horse really need antimicrobials, or can we just dress it and keep it clean and manage without drugs? It is also important, and I think particularly with the full with respiratory signs, to be sure that the drugs that you're using are actually justified. So use the diagnostic tests that are available to us to identify specific causative organisms. And just don't, don't um, do the sort of worry wart thing, oh, it might just be rhodococcus, therefore I've got to treat it with the heaviest weight antibiotics. But in fact, actually, a lot of these things are probably more um, not rhodococcus and might be better treated with less broad spectrum um, drugs. Um, so try to reach specific diagnoses rather than just make assumptions. If you are using antimicrobials, complete the full course, then stop. Do not save a bit of the drugs for the next horse, which might mean that you don't have to call the vet. That's very bad. Um, and you might also uh, ask your vet if their, if their particular practice has adopted the, the BEVA Protect Me policy, which is a strategy that was launched a couple of years ago now in the UK to encourage vets to monitor uh, antimicrobial use and resistant patterns. And finally, just wanted to um, acknowledge the Horse Race Spending Levy Board's contribution to all the research I've been talking about with respect to um, to colic. Um, these, 
that figure at the top, near just over 17 million is what they've spent over the last um, decade. Um, most of the, the the funds actually go to things that relate to to infectious disease. So you're all familiar with the codes of breeders. The HBLB makes a contribution along with the TBA and the Racehorse Owners Association to the Infectious Disease Service, and they um, fund the uh, inf influenza program and a big chunk of infectious infectious disease research. So that occupies well over um, a third of that pie there. Most of the research in prevention and treatment of disease, and make no apology for this actually, it's mostly targeted at us musculoskeletal research because what the group is obviously interested in is making racing a healthier and um, safer sport for us all to enjoy. And then finally they put some money into vet, uh, educating vet, young veterinary researchers and I'm emphasising that that's the blue pie up towards the top because actually most of the um, studies I've just talked to you about in fact have been funded through that programme. Now we all know that um, it, the racing right is a very exciting opportunity but I would just point out that, that with that exciting opportunity comes a little bit of a threat because the HBLB has a statutory requirement to do all this. In other words it's required by law. And the oversight is um, done by um, both veterinarians and scientists and the stakeholders have an input. But I think when, when we look to the future, it's very important that this robust, transparent and independent process continues. With that, I'll um, say thank you for your attention. <laughs>